Part fifteen of Collected Prose by James Elroy Flecker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. John Davidson, Realist, A Point of View. Three moderns, Ibsen, Nietzsche, and John Davidson all cry with one voice that as an antidote to our quiet self-satisfied ill-founded idealism we require the great virtues of strength and self-realization indeed they often forget that any other virtues have existence thus ibsen has portrayed peer gint with an onion in his hand peeling off husk after husk as he attempts by analogy to find his true self also he has told the tale of brand terrible idealist destroying all that love him by his self-denying devotion to duty again whoso loveth his god chastiseth him this is the sneer of nietzsche who evolves the overman whose strength justifies his power and john davidson in a passage which may be considered the crude germ of everything he has done in ballads eclogues songs plays testaments makes smith say to the woman he loves think my thought be impatient as i am obey your nature not authority and describes the hydra-headed creeds the sciences that deem the thing is known when it is named and literature thought's palace prison fair philosophy the grand inquisitor that racks ideas and is fooled with lies society the mud wherein we stand of such extreme importance then is mr davidson's outlook and his criticism of life that we shall best do him justice if we somewhat neglect the technical merits of his poetry glancing at them rapidly and passing on to his matter as soon as possible as a beautiful prelude i quote a lyric from scaramouche in naxos the boat is chafing at our long delay and we must leave too soon the spicy sea pinks and the inborn spray the tawny sands the moon Keep us, O Thetis, on our western flight. Watch from thy pearly throne, our vessel plunging deeper into night to reach a land unknown. Even the bare recital of these faultless lines, not to mention those already quoted from Smith, are enough to show that, from the first, Mr. John Davidson was no minor poet. The questions a critic must answer if he would attempt to estimate his author's rank are how lofty is his ambition and next how far does he realize it it seems to me that mr davidson's ambition rivals that of any author who ever took up pen to write in fact one sometimes has an uncomfortable feeling that he is not great enough to carry out his aims but he so far succeeds that his imperfections surpass the perfections of other men so we must deal with him as we would deal say with keats shelley or tennyson first of all then we will acknowledge mr davidson's faults they are quite obvious being chiefly due to a strained desire for simplicity and to perpetual over-emphasis of his point sometimes he will spoil a ballad with lines too colloquial for the hurrying metre sometimes he will just mar a fine speech in blank verse by getting it involved and hard to follow or by the unnecessary introduction of some abrupt phrase from common parlance this is naturally more apparent in his earlier works. A conspicuous example of both of these faults is the great dying speech of Hallows in Smith. Ballads like an exodus from Houndsditch or the vengeance of the Duchess fail because their language is too commonplace for their thought, and generally Mr. Davidson is liable to lapse into the grotesque. Besides this, he is often led away by some fantastic simile, especially if he can haul in head and shoulders a reference to nature speaking generally if one must find a purely technical fault in mr davidson that fault will be an impetuousness that leads him sometimes to disregard the symmetry and form of his work he has too little restraint or power of self-criticism in matters purely artistic nevertheless of his blank verse i will say simply that it is the best since that of milton its majesty and grace cannot fail to impress all readers. It is packed and terse like Marlowe's, varied, yet without Tennysonian thinness or the monotony of Shelley. 
Perhaps the most interesting point about Mr. Davidson's poetry is his extraordinary objectivity. Mr. Davidson is the first realist that has appeared in English poetry. One is pleasantly surprised at that, as on first realising that Milton was a roundhead. Indeed, poetry has no greater foe than a gaudy veil of romance, which easily obscures the import of facts. And let me not forget to notice the extreme originality of the man. One or two of his earliest plays seem more or less influenced by the Elizabethans, but are so fresh and vivid that some of us would wish him to cast aside his purpose and abandon himself once more to the Venus of pure delight. But there is little enough that resembles his eclogues, ballads, testaments, or plays, and we may still hope for a masterpiece greater than these. His work has, after all, only just begun. All Mr. Davidson's work is dramatic. The eclogues are so in form, the testaments are dramatic monologues, even the ballads breathe of drama. His most splendid dramatic achievement, Self's the Man, is remarkable for extreme restraint and careful writing. It is not like many plays in verse of today, a series of dialogues in decorated English. This tragic comedy is quite stageable, full of incident, masterly in composition and form. The character of Urban, the tyrant hero, is strongly drawn. In one fine scene, where Urban and his former mistress, Saturnia, meet in peril of their lives, we may experience that strange, almost physical thrill, that sense of the world being in harmony with the verse, which is only to be found here and there throughout literature, and which cannot be explained, save as a recollection of things experienced in a former existence. I have seen the Cenci, called the best place in Shakespeare, a play in which one perpetually feels that the author is struggling to write lyrics cannot surely be compared with the Duchess of Malfi. It is as certainly inferior to Self's the Man. The first work in which Mr. Davidson displays his characteristic attitude towards life is Smith, the tragic farce written in 1886. This play opens in a public house. Brown, from Oxford, Jones and Robinson are discussing the character of Hallows, a poet. Brown, the very apostle of compromise, blames the poet for his absurd enthusiasms, and begins abusing Smith, who has a peculiar way of talking literature and philosophy with barmaids. Then Jones describes Smith as a mere savage, barbarous as a lap, a handsome creature but elliptical. In this triumvirate of fools, Brown is cultured and foolish, Jones epigrammatic and foolish, and Robinson who has points to raise and exclaims fair very fair at intervals in sympathetic inanity is fatuous and foolish and they agree well together just as brown has announced the fact that he is to wed his cousin magdalen in a month smith bursts in upon them like a whirlwind smith is annoyed with their idle talk about hallows and finally calls them the commonest type of biped crawling here and at length clears them out with you sots, you maggots, shavings, asteroids, a million of you wouldn't make a man. Out, or I'll strike you, monkeys, mannequins. Hallows enters, and tells how he is going to his new-found retreat of Garth. In the north a hamlet like a cave, nestling unknown in tawny Merlin's side. There, he says, he will write poetry, be it but one line a day. He rejects Smith's advice to let fame alone. Fame, says Hallows, is the breath of power, and he continues, clearly voicing the ideas of the dramatist himself. Give me to dream, dreams, all would love to dream, to tell the world's truth, hear the world tramp time with satin slippers and with hobnail shoes to my true singing. Fame is worth its cost, blood sweats and tears, and haggard homeless lives. How dare a man, appealing to the world, content himself with ten, how dare a man appeal to ten when all the world should hear? How dare a man conceive himself as else than his own fool without the world's hurrah to echo him? Smith, but if the world won't shout till he be dead? Hallows, let him address the street. No subtle essences, ethereal tones for senses sick, bedridden in the down of culture and its stifling curtains. They decide to go to Garth together, and Smith agrees with Hallows in the last lines of the act. You are right. 
one must become fanatic be a wedge a thunderbolt to smite a passage through the close-grained world the next act introduces graham father of magdalen and magdalen herself with magdalen smith falls in love at first sight and in four pages of remarkable and splendid dialogue he makes her confess that she is being made to marry brown against her will and that she finds in him smith the masterful nature women love the passage contains the lines quoted above think my thought be impatient as i am the next scene takes place on the top of mount merlin where hallows is discovered lying with a notebook by his side he has opened one of his veins and is dying after cursing his unhappiness and poverty he speaks these glorious words feeling death upon him but i have chosen death death and the moon hangs low and broad upon the eastern verge above a mist that floods the orient filling the deep ravines and shallow vales lake-like and wan embossed with crested isles of pine and birch death and the drops of day still stain the west a faintest tinge of rose the stars cannot o'erwash with innocence death and the mountain tops peak after peak lie close and dark beneath orion's sword death and the houses nestle at my feet with ruddy human windows here and there piercing the velvet shade deep in the world old hedgerows and sweet bypaths through the corn the river like a sleepless eye looks up pale shafts of smoke ascend from homely hearths and fade in middle air like happy sighs death and the wind blows chill across my face the thin long hoary grass waves at my side with muffled tinkling not yet no my life has not ebbed all away i want to live a little while is the moon gone so soon they've put the shutters to down there the wind is warm death is it death i had no chance perhaps i'll have another where i go another chance how black dies after this smith is seen carrying magdalen up to the summit of the mountain and the summit of their own mad happiness while he is still standing amazed at the death of hallows graham and brown rush up in pursuit a splendid scene follows smith uses force to prevent them from taking magdalen from him can we not go asks magdalen yes smith replies yes we can go where none will follow us we two could never love each other more than now we do never our souls could mount higher on passion's fire-plumed wings nor yet could laughter of our children's children pierce with keener pangs of happiness our hearts i have a million things to tell my love but i will keep them for eternity good earth good mother earth my mate and me take us he leaps with her over the precipice graham rushes forward but falls fainting enter villagers shouting and laughing i think enough has been said enough extracts given to show that smith brought something strong and vital into our literature all mr davidson's work carries this same message of deliverance take the most powerful and the best written of his ballads the ballad in blank verse of the making of a poet it is a story told with intimate observation and is perhaps drawn from experience the scene is a scottish port a boy whose romantic materialism seems to combine the types of smith and hallows is the source of all his parents grief because he refuses to acknowledge himself a christian when his parents talked to him of christ he used to see the cyprian aphrodite all one blush and glance of passion from the violet sea step in land fastening as she went her zone his mother dies heartbroken at his sinfulness in a moment of weak contrition he takes the eucharist and suddenly it crosses his mind i eat and drink damnation to myself to give my father's troubled spirit peace yet there was no peace for the boy himself but in the evening by the purple firth he walked and saw brown locks upon the brine and pale hands beckon him to come away 
where mermaids with their harps and golden combs sit throned upon the carven antique poops of treasure ships and soft sea dirges sing over the green gilt bones of mariners he wanders on till night pondering how all creeds are one creed the creed of slavery bidding them fly away like evil vultures he is inspired by the idea that he is after all god to himself that every man is his own god has a right to will as he desires he feels to be a doctrine of salvation which he ought to proclaim to the world at home where millions mope in labyrinths of hideous streets astray without a clue unfed unsexed unsold unhelped i bring life with the gospel up quit you like gods with this message he breaks in upon his father's new-found happiness and plunges him in the bitterness of despair and sorrow this was the sin of lucifer to make himself god's equal and his father also dies of grief crying out to his saviour wishing even to be sent to hell if so he might see his boy again there follows a long passage of stately verse wherein the boy after cursing creed and dogma proclaims the gospel of self's the man i am a man set by to overhear the inner harmony the very tune of nature's heart to be a thoroughfare for all the pageantry of time to catch the mutterings of the spirit and the hour and make them known and of the lowliest to be the minister and therefore reign prince of the powers of the air lord of the world and master of the sea within my heart i'll gather all the universe and sing as sweetly as the spheres and i shall be the first of men to understand himself nor can too high praise be given to the ballad of heaven here a musician toils at one great work for years his wife and child die he cannot feed or maintain them he lives but for his music yet he is welcome to heaven by god himself and by his wife and child god smiling took him by the hand and led him to the brink of heaven he saw where systems whirling stand where galaxies like snow are driven dead silence reigned a shudder ran through space time furled his wearied wings a slow adagio then began sweetly resolving troubled things the dead were heralded along as if with drums and trumps of flame and flutes and oboes keen and strong a brave andante singing came then like a python's sumptuous dress the frame of things was cast away and out of time's obscure distress the conquering scherzo thundered day he doubted but god said even so nothing is lost that's wrought with tears the music that you made below is now the music of the spheres of the other ballads many of them as also the ordeal treat of that fine type of woman which mr davidson has created for himself a woman strong in her loves and hates fit wife of a strong man a woman of the force of agrippina without her malignant cruelty a woman naturally queen besides these i will only mention the fine ballad of tannhäuser mr davidson gives the tale a different ending from what we know best in it tannhäuser returns to his first mistress in the venusberg having been rejected by the pope and lives with her in immortal happiness as he lay worshipping his bride while rose leaves in her bosom fell and dreams came sailing on a tide of sleep he heard a matin bell hark let us leave the magic hill he said and live on earth with men no here she said we stay until the golden age shall come again and so they wait while empires sprung of hatred thunder past above deep in the earth for ever young tannhäuser and the queen of love mr davidson adds an interesting note as follows the story of tannhäuser is best known in the sophisticated version of wagner's great opera in reverting to a simpler form i have endeavoured to present passion rather than sentiment and once more to bear a hand in laying the ghost of an unwholesome idea that still haunts the world the idea of the inherent impurity of nature i beg to submit to those who may be disposed to think with me and also those who though otherwise minded are at liberty to alter their opinions that a new ballad of tannhäuser 
is not only the most modern but the most humane interpretation of the world legend with which it deals we now come to testaments the first is the amazing testament of a vivisector which neither upholds nor reprobates vivisection the vivisector vivisects himself mr davidson indeed has been praised for condemning vivisection for is not vivisection an infamy too gross for the common terms of scorn contempt and abhorrence but we shall see that we have only to read the author's prefatory note to find that any such view is false the testament of a vivisector is the first of a series of poems i propose publishing at intervals in this form and the new statement of materialism it contains is likely to offend both the religious and the irreligious mind this poem therefore and its successors my testaments are addressed to those who are willing to place all ideas in the crucible and who are not afraid to fathom what is subconscious in themselves and others the testament of a vivisector to many will appear repulsive for the vivisector proclaims and brazens out the fact that he loves vivisection because it fills him with a pleasing sense of mastery and because it satisfies his lust for inflicting pain few things more grimly straightforward have been written anyone reading it will appreciate the title john davidson realist in the testament of a man forbid we have smith once more struggling against an unsympathetic world exclaiming against the men that balance libraries upon their poles the exordium is superb the testament of an empire builder opens humorously after the old fashion of scaramouche the empire builder has a vision of the beasts who are talking about man they discuss his infirmities his selfishness his power nenouk the polar bear explains to the mastiff that he is unhappy about his prospects of immortality and of the endless heavenly feast on blubbered seals that slumber on the flows in reply a flea ensconced behind the mastiff's ear chirruped aloud nenouk my friend take heart i for example must be soundly squelched but the idea of the flea remains for race continues always permanence of species is an established theory established nonsense neighbour hold your tongue snorted the domineering elephant who goes on to catalogue extinct species of beasts the mammoth the plesiosaur and so on a bumptious groundling ape is informed that man would exterminate him if he had any sense the hackney and the lion also detail their woes and the skunk makes occasional interpolations by way of comic relief the nightmare over the empire builder discovers himself in an english lane watching butcher birds with interest and admiration the rest of the testament contains quite a novel idea that is also worked out in the prime minister namely that the proud in spirit are quartered in heaven while the poor in spirit are dismissed to hell mr davidson's whole doctrine seems to me to lie in the title of his play self's the man he goes even further than ibsen as he has himself hinted in the preface to godfrida ibsen's message was break conventions if they hinder true happiness or noble action he has perhaps blurred the outline of his doctrine by his natural mysticism strange voices of earth and air that call brand as he dies amid the avalanche of his broken ideals those people who will be apt to say that mr davidson's rationalism is now out of date and who continue to acquiesce in what they know to be a palpable lie will probably think that the message break convention is an old one now obsolete to such people unconventionality seems to mean little more than wearing a cap on sunday it was no freakish foolery that ibsen commended his message was as fresh as dawn he urged the overhauling of all our social machinery he attacks with terrible precision the shoddy idealism and the prudish self-complacency that still pervades modern life how can mr davidson go even further than this it is in this way he says not only break conventions that stand in your way but live as if convention as if christianity as if thirty centuries of literature had never existed he puts a new and far more difficult interpretation on the know thyself of old 
to this his doctrine he assigns as metaphysic not mysticism but materialism intimately connected with mr davidson's philosophy of life is his passion for the country he loves nature for her simplicity and beauty and writes about it as if it were a new and particular revelation as if it had never become a hackneyed theme as if spring poets had never been bywords we have seen how it is sometimes a hindrance he can never turn his thoughts away from the fields for long as for the sea what could be more convincing than these lines from the man forbid the bosomed plain that strips her green robe to the saffron shore and steps into the surf where threads and scales and arabesques of blue and emerald wave begin to damascene the iron sea i doubt if the most ardent admirer would stand by this reformer in his utter condemnation of christianity convention and culture and take refuge in a materialism that says the body and soul are one but more might be inclined to agree with the fascinating theory held unconsciously by the greeks and held very consciously by this least greek of poets the theory of man's natural sinlessness if calvary has a meaning for mr davidson it means the death of sin many again would strenuously deny that culture is evil claiming perhaps that nothing leads a man to reality to the examination of self and of conventions to a broad and catholic view of life with more inevitable sureness than a liberal education and the tolerance that only culture can instil yet have we not all been at times disgusted by the men that display an apathy proportionate to their learning do we not know and hate the type of individual that takes holy orders out of a vague desire to improve humanity by his miserable assistance that is by preaching a creed which he neither firmly believes nor thoroughly understands do not the courts of the temple swarm with those who fear to commit themselves to anything in heaven above or earth beneath i have observed it is with this apathy that mr davidson has had to contend for twenty years he has been preaching a sermon of great meaning and he has received nothing but compliments on his poetical cornucopia no wonder he finds little consolation in culture as he writes play ballad eclogue and testament repeating his tremendous tale with magnificent variety there is a hard lesson for us in the writings of mr davidson we are convinced by him that if we want to found our idealism on some basis less flimsy than that of sentiment we must strip off the ideals that now obsess us if we desire to arrive at a true appreciation of life or literature we must criticise as if no one had anticipated us in the work to compensate for nineteen hundred years of error we must cultivate the neglected virtue of strength only thus can we be ourselves and fully realise our latent power after all the thesis of materialism that we find set before us here is not so repellent as it seems after years of what is little better than manichaeism we are at last told that matter is not impure but lovely that man should be one with the mountains that the landscapes of the world are beautiful not because of a soul residing in them nor because their creator had aesthetic ideals but because they are what they are lovely in themselves end of part 15 read by phil benson